experts, not only in Nigeria, but the world over. But first, it gives me absolute pleasure to invite the host for today in the person of Temi Giwa. Where is she? She runs Life Bank. Um, what, I mean, she's one of the brightest people that we have, young people. In fact, it's not fair to call her a young person, but that we have in this country. I mean, what Temi does for this country is unbelievable. She's recognized worldwide for her work. You should do a bit of research on her. Um, and I'm going to invite the lovely Aisha Armayu, who is a psychiatrist uh, living in Nigeria. Is she here? Where are you? Ah, there you are, because we haven't met yet. I think we've exchanged emails, but we have never met. Please, you're very welcome. Where are the, the labels now? Before they think that she's Professor Yebodi. <laughs> and um, we, we've had, um, it's just automatic for me. I won in East London. She just sent me the invitation um, to come and watch the unveiling. Absolutely fantastic. She's a therapist as well. Please welcome Leila Hussein to the panel, all the way from London. And um, we've, we have an extra guest on this panel. Um, and the reason is um, it, it, he's supposed to actually speak tomorrow. But he's been with us for two days now. Um, incredible professor. He's actually more of, um, he writes more about politics than mental health. But sometimes in Nigeria, we see the behavior of politicians. <laughs> you see there's a very strong link between those two issues. Do you agree? Yes. Uh -huh. So, um, and because he has to leave us today and will therefore not be able to sit on his panel tomorrow, which is a massive loss, I decided that we're not just going to, in fact, it was Kaede Ogundamisi that said, how can we make sure we get Professor Jiprin to speak? And I said, you are absolutely right. So we've decided to put him on this panel so at least we get to hear his voice and learn from him. Professor Jibrin Ibrahim. So, Temi, over to you. If you can all check your mics very quickly. Let's, you've got yours. Pro, uh, doctor, let's, let's hear your voice. I just want to see if it's as nice as your emails. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry, I'm, um, I have cold. So my voice might not be very clear. Your I'll voice try. will be clear. I will give you my own mic, don't worry. <laughs> Layla? Layla's uh, email? Uh, sorry, email? Mic. <laughs> I think I should be on this panel. Hello? Oh, yeah, it's working now. Yeah, we're there. Yep, yep, okay. Yep. We... Timmy, I'm going to give you mine. Prof, Hello. it's not working. Hello. Let's try. Excellent. Hello, Let's good morning. Thank you, sir. Oh. Good morning. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Auntie Lola. Uh, I'm so glad to be with all of you guys this morning. Um, when I was reading your profiles, I was just getting so excited. I thought, oh, these are my people, these are my tribe. Uh, people would think about uh, women and healthcare and mental healthcare. Um, so I'm gonna have a, uh, each of you introduce yourself briefly. Uh, you can take uh, maybe five sentences to tell, you, tell us a little bit, sorry, not specific, <laughs> I'm just giving you. Um, you can get, just take a, briefly tell me, tell the audience a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do, and and yeah. Good morning, everybody. Once again, I greet you. I am Dr. Aisha Tuisho Armia. I'm a consultant psychiatrist with a subspecialty in forensic psychiatry. I am the head of the forensic psychiatry unit at the Joss University Teaching Hospital, and I'm privileged to tell you that I'm the one and only female consultant psychiatrist fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College and the West African Postgraduate Medical College and the only female psychiatrist in Northwest Nigeria. How do you follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kabafest, thank you for having me. And Lola, thank you for inviting me again. Uh, I always get worried when people invite me. I'm like, do they know who they're bringing to these platforms? Um, I'm Leila Hussein. I'm originally from Somalia, but I grew up in London. 
Uh, I'm a psychotherapist by practice. I founded actually the first counseling service for survivors of female genital mutilation, but our work has now gone on to work with women who have experienced sexual abuse. Basically, anything where patriarchy has tainted women, we take them on in our clinic. And um, we, unfortunately, we are still the only clinic in Europe, as busy as that is. I always felt that we need to have more of that. And um, I guess my other job is I'm also a leading campaigner. I'm a bit of a troublemaker. I like really annoying politicians if they're not doing their jobs properly. I'm known for trying to chase Theresa May. Well, I tried to chase her with a six-foot vagina costume one time. <laughs> I, I did, because I wanted her to really understand the issues of women. So I really got to the actual genital bit. So I'm known for being quite direct in the work that I do, and I'm an accidental writer, filmmaker, and uh, I'm a mother of a 16-year-old feminist. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Femi Oyabode. I um, studied in the Badon and uh, left Nigeria in 1979, so... I've lived, lived outside Nigeria for 40 years or thereabouts. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist by training. Uh, I'm a retired psychiatrist, but I work part-time and do two clinical days and one academic day, and, and I write a little as well. Uh, my name is uh, Jibrene Bryan. In my first life, I taught political science <laughs> in, in Amadou Bello University for 20 years. Uh, in my second life, I, every Friday morning, by daily trust, and you can read me, and today the topic is what? Fantastic. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the the uh, the question of gender and how that affects uh, mental health care, uh, especially in in uh, traditional societies and societies where misogyny and the patriarchy is still a significant part of uh, the social fabric. So I, I wanted to ask um, first, uh, doctor, um, how is it in northern Nigeria, how do, what are the attitudes around uh, mental health care, uh, especially with women in northern Nigeria? Well, um, I was supposed to be here on Tuesday, but I couldn't be here. I was in Kasana. From Joss, I visit Kasana every month. I'm in Kasana for a week. That's about seven hours. I've been doing this for two and a half years. I decided to do that, to pay back to my state. The statistics we have from January to July 2018, we have seen 16,590 patients, psychiatric patients, 175 new cases between January and July. Out of 16,580, 10,900 are female. Yeah. Out of the new cases, out of 600 plus, 500 are female. Now, every week in Kasana Clinic, every week, outpatients, we see 604 patients on an average. For the new cases, we see 64 new cases on an average every week. In JOS, my clinic, I see an average of 100 patients every week. And I see an average of 10 new patients every week, which I decline. I can't work like that. I need to do other things. So we have a lot of psychiatric problems in the female, especially postpartum psychosis, which are usually seen in the primary gravida. That's the new mothers. And most of my patients have no social support because once a woman gets a mental illness, unfortunately, she is left for her family. The husband moves on. Whereas for the men, the wives hold on for 20 years. I have a friend who has a husband. She's a medical doctor. She's a consultant like me. She has been living with her mentally ill husband for 20 years. 
She practically does everything. Now, we have a lot of crisis. A lot of me men have died. We have a lot of widow. In the IDP camps, you see them, right? This woman, we are talking about substance abuse. We are talking about things going down. Most of these women are not well, okay? They are ill. You don't see them as ill because we concentrate on the physical part of the, the patient. We don't look at the, the mental health aspect. Most IDP camps, most um, places we keep people as in IDPs, what do we take there? Rice, beans, sanitary towels, and stuff like that. Nobody cares about their mental health. Nobody cares. It's the physical health that is the problem. Unfortunately, whatever you take to this woman is useless. Why did I say that? They can't use it because they are psychologically broken. They are traumatized. So whatever you take, they don't see the benefit. They are broken. They cannot take care of themselves. So how do you want them to take care of their children? We have a burden. I walk in just, just as she said, I got the news of the break. What had happened? And usually they are taken to the hospital. It is on a daily basis now in Joss. It is on a daily basis. They go in cars, shoot people, kill them. And unfortunately, when that thing happened, I don't even have access to the hospital. Why? If you see me, you, that's the hospital. The bulk of the hospital are not House of Flying. And, the, and everybody says it hurts men. That's the latest. So I'm a hurts woman. You get. But unfortunately, I find my way. I find my way. Sometimes I dress. I don't dress this way. I cover my face or I go be at the boot of my colleague's car to get there. Yes, because I have to take what I know. I am passionate about mental health and I fight for mental health. And if you see me fight with anybody, it's about my patient, the mentally ill patient. Whatever you aspire to be, be passionate. Take it to the latter. Even if you don't get paid now, sometime in life, your work will work for you, even when you die. So female gender are really in a mess, us and our children. I'm just giving you this statistic so that you know. This is Kasana and Joss. We have a million and one. I've been to Yobe, I've been to Medugri, I've been to different places. And it's about the same picture. In the camp of a thousand people, almost all of them are female and children. There are 1,000 of them. They have seven toilets. For crying out loud, even the environment is a psychological trauma, again, to the patients. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very powerful. Um, and, and it helps us frame the issue that we're discussing uh, today. Can um, I just add a point to sure. that, actually, just a quick point. I think, I mean, the same issues you describe, you'll find it anywhere in the world where women are actually based. But I think the issue has never been um, the fact that, obviously, they have mental health issues and they're just beca because they're women. The problem has been the systematic uh, 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 control women are constantly living under. If we are constantly controlled by on women, we'll always exist. So we need to go back to the problem, the foundation, is that we need to start changing policies and laws that actually affect us on a daily basis. We still live in a world where women, some women can't even go out and get a job or get an education. That has an implication on her mental health. So I think it's great that we can acknowledge all the problems, but the real problem is the actual the environment the women are being put in in the first place. And, and What are the sort of structural themes that women face um, when, we, when we're talking about the patriarchy? What are the details of how women actually live under patriarchy? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 how, and how that affects their, their mental health? I mean, from my experience, I, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, I have a client who not only has undergone female genital mutilation, but she also has a, a practice called um, breast ironing. So where they remove women's breasts. And yeah. So I, I, it was one of those days where I just felt. So, so breast ironing is practiced in, just by a, a tribe in Nigeria as well. In Congo, yeah, it is. Yeah, some people know. So basically it means you either cut the women's breasts or you burn it with a hot stone 
or press it with uh, 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 gauze. The idea means her breast can easily attract men. So to protect her, you, you basically remove any vision of the breast. Instead of telling men not to rape women, which will be the easiest way, what we, we, what we still do, and we've seen this in London, in the so-called country, you know, a place where things are free. But I guess women are not just, it's not just cutting of their body. And I remember this particular client, she couldn't have even uh, surgery on her genitals because she was cut to the bone, wow. where if they, did, if they even opened her, it meant her internal organs would be exposed. So it was one of those days when I came out of my clinic and I thought, I know the world didn't like women much, but this is some other level. And for me, one of the things that we, I, I did at the Dahlia Project was, number one, not apologize for creating a safe space for women only. I wasn't going to apologize for that because I do have a group of people that say, oh, you've been sexist. I'm not being sexist. We are not safe, so I'm not apologizing for creating a safe space for us women. Number two, the community I work with are mainly African community and Asian community. Therapy is a totally, it has a totally this taboo, negative connotation. In our language, we don't even have the word mental health. We have the word crazy. That's all we say. And I'm sure if all of you, I don't know how you're saying your languages, but I don't think it has a positive connotation. So one, one of the things we started doing, we changed the language in our clinic. So we use the word emotional well-being, taking care of yourself. I remember one client said to me, am I going to be electrocuted? Because that was her experience in mental health. So in our clinic now, one of the first things we do before anyone goes into any form of therapy, they have three workshops where they actually learn how, what mental health means, how uh, therapy sessions actually work. Um, but in those three sessions, they're getting to know us. It's building a safe space for them to come in. So that's the approach I took with my, with my clinic. But obviously, I annoyed a lot of so-called psychiatric world, you know, the whole BACP and all those people, because the world of uh, uh, therapy is built mainly for Westerners. So I had to fight. What do I do for African women? Because I said, how does my mother come to these clinics? So instead of being a clinic in a particular building, we became an outreach counseling service. So we would go to where the women are and started running support groups in those spaces. And the women will dictate where it's going to happen, which time, which day. We will provide childcare, pay for their travel, make sure they say we have runners that actually pick the women up from location. Because some of them can't actually read their own languages. So it's really going that further when we develop such service. It, it had to be quite unique to get it to where it is today. And because of that, we've now become one of the most successful clinics in Europe because of it. Because we, we made it accessible as possible. I want my daughter to be able to access it. I want my grandmother to be able to access that service. Um, Prof, you have worked um, in outside Nigeria, and, but you were trained in Nigeria. Um, briefly, what are the differences in how we think about mental health, especially in academia and in clinical services? Um, and how, what, are the what are the differences and how can we sort of um, solve a lot of the structural access problem uh, for patients? Yes. Thank, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm a little bit anxious now because we've got women on one side and we've got men on the other side. It's a bit, um, I'm anxious a little, I think. Um, I think the first thing to do, uh, obviously, the, there are deep-seated deep -seated issues. So structurally, if you, if you just think of the fact that uh, by Nigeria's own uh, admission, it spends uh, $115 per head of population on health care. That's $115. The UK spends three and a half thousand US dollars per head of population on health care. And the US spends something of the order of between five and nine thousand dollars, depends on whose figures you're looking at. And that tells you fairly straightforwardly what you need to know about structures because what you pay for is what you get. You know, that's just fairly straightforward. Um, so, so once you, you understand the amount of money that's spent, once you know that uh, there is 0 0.04 psychiatrist to 100,000 people in Nigeria, by Nigeria's own admission, and, and you have 30 psychiatrists per 100,000 in the UK, you know straight away that what my colleague has been saying about the 
burden she carries um, is true, but that's to do with it's to do with funding, to do with financing. So, so we let's put that there. Second thing I want to say, which is quite important, I think, is that culture has a a, a big big impact on on how um, uh, health services are organised and how mental health services in particular are organised. And people very rarely recognize that culture informs politics. I, of course, I don't mean politics, I mean policy, because policy is driven by politics. So what I mean by that is that if your culture doesn't value the health of a single individual, then it doesn't fund it. And if your culture doesn't value psychological matters, then it doesn't fund it, because the guys who are going to vote on the budget, the votes on the budget is determined by cultural values. Uh, so, so there's a very tight link between cultural values and how politics and policy operates. So, so that's also very clear, so we can put that into, into the arms of politicians. But at a more kind of ordinary level, at our level, at the levels of ordinary people like us, the, the culture has a, a determining effect on how you decide whether you're ill, what you decide what is the cause of your illness is, what you decide you can tell other people. I was uh, absolutely, just totally amazed at the previous session because when I was a young man, the previous session we had where people were able to talk about how they felt, that would never have happened. And, and that has implications for psychotherapy because you, you don't go and talk to somebody else if you don't believe that you can talk about personal matters that reflect on your interaction with your mother hurt you or the fact that your parents left you to live with other relatives because they wanted to prioritize their own education when that has an implication for your own emotional life. So, so cultural values matters because it structures access to care, it structures what you think is illness, it structures how you interact with your, with your uh, healthcare practitioner. So if I give that as an example, give an example of that, it, when I work in, um, when I work in, uh, in, Hong, in, in Singapore, Singaporeans like us are very hierarchical in their personal relationships. So they expect to be told what to do. So if you're a patient, you, you don't have a discussion with a doctor, you just want the doctor to tell you, take this tablet two times a day and come back and see me in a month. Now you can't do that in Birmingham because the culture expects that you have a, a consultation, which is what consultation means, that you have an interaction with the person, that you have a negotiation with the other person. And if you were to be dictatorial and to tell the person what to do, then they're going to think you're a bad, a bad doctor. So you can see straight away that culture has an influence on the patient-doctor interaction and how information is given and exchanged and all that sort of stuff. So, so to, to come back to your question, the, the um, where you work, where you practice, has an influence on the ways in which the patients come to you, it has an influence on the amount of money the government spends, it has an Im influence on the likely outcome, so you've already heard that if you're real, uh, and they find out you're real, that has implications for your children, whether your children are marriageable or not. Did you such me? So, so all of that is informed by structure, and uh, and forgive me for saying it, and I'm anxious to say, um, it it is not helpful. It never is helpful to have a kind of black and white discussions about men and women and patri, because life is in shades of grey. That's just what it is. Life is very complex, and um, and and things are never simple. And any attempt to make life look as if it's simple, um, then you're living a Trumpian world, as you know. It's a world where you give answers which are very nice, which receive claps, but which are necessarily helpful to the rest of us. Right. Um, so we've seen, uh, the doctor has talked about how the burden she faces um, as a psychiatrist in Nigeria. And it's mentioned, um, Fofi has mentioned funding and 
and um, Lola also mentioned the problem that's going on in jobs and, and the insurgency. Now, politics has a lot to play in all these three. I think personally that politician creates problem and then first a psychiatrist uh, to deal with the fallout of the problems they create. Um, how does, what is the role that politician and politics, um, wh what must we do in our politics to make, for, for politicians to start prioritizing the mental health of their people and, and making decisions while thinking about that? Uh, I would want to respond to that question later on, but I prefer to start by talking about my clinic. I mean, sure. since everybody here runs a clinic, <laughs> let me talk about my clinic, which is society. I mean, uh, sicknesses that confront Nigerian society, and to understand up these background sicknesses that generate this uh, breakdown of uh, mental health. The first has to do with religion. Uh, you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> 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 My mic. <laughs> Nigeria is a very rare country because in four decades, between 30 and 40 percent of the population changed their religion, their modes of worship, and their engagement with spirituality. Within Islam, Nigerian Islam was Sufi Islam. Tijaniya brand, Kadiriya brand. Within these four decades, 30 to 40 percent of Muslims became Izala, which is a form of Wahhabism. This broke family bonds. It broke, above all, social, uh, socialization into religious values. Exactly the same thing happened with Christianity over exactly the same period. The Catholics and the Orthodox churches, the Protestants, Methodists, and all that, 30 to 40% converted to Pentecostalism. Exactly the same period. And the impact was identical. No society can have such a profound religious change and remain safe. This is because of the nature of the new religious movements. Both Wahhabism, or Salafism as, as it is called, and Pentecostalism have identical characteristics in terms of organization of religious practice. The first essence of that characteristic is that salvation is individual. It's not collective, it's not in the family. And religious change or conversion must be accompanied by listening no more to your parents if they haven't converted with you, your religious clergy, if they are not of their religion, and this in a very profound manner began to break family bonds. But it affected much more profoundly socialization. Values are acquired from two sources, from family and from your teachers. Now, when you engage in religious conversion that has an emphasis on this issue of the individual, the passage of confidence, discussion, posing and seeking solutions to problems 
revert from uh, your family's uh, context to the new religious teachers. Many of these religious teachers, the new ones, are not as well trained in theology as the previous ones. And that creates the general background of the crisis we are having. There's a second issue that has emerged from my clinic. <laughs> which, uh, I mean, I have to show I'm like this uh, line <laughs> the, <laughs> the second issue has to do with basically the decomposition of the family, especially about the family of the poor. On this matter, there is a huge distinction that has occurred with uh, class differentiation in Nigeria. Family bonds among the upper classes have increased over the last 40 years. Uh, the elites are committed to the education of their children. The elite have changed their habits even in northern Nigeria like, for instance, they've stopped early marriage of their children and all that. Exactly the opposite has happened with the family of the poor, especially in northern Nigeria. N uh, this part of the world, starting from where we are in Kaduna, going northwards towards southern Niger, has one characteristic. It has the highest fertility in the contemporary world. A woman has a fertility of 7.4. That is the average number of uh, children produced in her lifetime, 7.4. There's no part of the world that has. For the poor in northern Nigeria, they can take care of their children. What do they do? Between 13 and 15, they marry out as Almajiri because they can feed them. Therefore, you have a context in which such a huge population of the young is disrupted too early in life. The girls to early marriage, which fail, and they remarry, and they continue to re remarry. The boys, 12, 13, 14 million, there's a debate about the exact number, uh, al Majri, growing up without parental care. Why wouldn't they be sick? Go ahead. Um, I, I just thought it would be helpful just to, to respond to what we've just heard. Because we know this is, these are not matters of opinion, so you have to distinguish between opinions and facts. It is a truth that your personal personality, your character is developed. And we, we know what needs to happen for you to have a healthy adult life. And, and one of the uh, uh, interesting aspects of it is that much of that work was done in Uganda by an American psychologist, a woman called Margaret Ainsworth. That your, the capacity of your mother, who is your primary caregiver, to, to listen attentively to you, to understand you when you cry, to, know, to understand whether your crying is for food, whether your crying is for pain, whether your crying is because you are wet, and whether she looks you in the eye directly and whether she, she points to objects in the external world and gives them a name, and, uh, and again, to go back to the last talk, the last session we had, where we had that absolutely wonderful description of the fact that naming something is a, a crucial to human life. So, so the, what is, is a technically word, technical term for it is called joint attention, that this mother looks you in the eye and points at something. So all that is important. And, and what we are hearing is that there's a disruption in the early processes. So what that does is that you've got what my psychotherapy colleagues will call insecure attachment. Now, if you've got insecure attachment, no wonder you're going to have a bad marriage. 
No wonder you're going to have difficulty interacting with other adult human beings. No wonder you're going to have difficulty in regulating your emotions. No, no wonder you're going to have difficulty in being able to uh, uh, control your impulses so that you, everybody wants to do bad things from time to time. But some of us, because of our upbringing and our, our childhood experiences, we have the capacity to control those impulses. So what you're having is a kind of bed, you know, the kind of preparation for a, a life of total instability, and that's just what we've heard. So I think we understand the problem now. Um, let's start thinking about, I, I wanted to ask about solution. Um, we know that um, cultural change is hard. It's very difficult. Um, and I think we have an opportunity with um, the insurgency and the fact that women, the role of women in, in northern Nigeria is morphing into, um, it's, it's not what it used to be. Um, now women are heading households. Uh, women are working outside the house. How do you sort of, how do you work, how do you bring about cultural change in a way that is not too fast to create a lot of mental problems, but that, you know, gets us where we want to go? Thanks for you. Well, um, before then, I have something on my laptop, on, on my iPad. It's a paper I wrote myself. It was African Insight. It's on drugs. The paper, my own caption there is drug abuse and crime in West What prospects? I took a 10-year prospect from the time I wrote the paper, which was last year. And as he said, the, um, the fertility and the population expulsion and the amount of youths we'll have. At the end of my paper, I will post it to anybody that wants. I have the, the soft copy here. In the next 10 to 15 years, right, the sane will become the insane, and the insane will become the sane. I'm a forensic psychiatrist, and I took my time to go to the prison, okay? I'm a bit different in everything I do. I joined psychiatry, I finished again, and then I went into forensic psychiatry again, which is another area that no, there are no females there. And there, again, I go to the prison. So most of my patients are high-profile prisoners on death row, homicide offenders. That's my field. I deal with homicide offenders. Most of the prisoners I see, armed robbery suspects, about 56% of them were intoxicated at the time of their offense. So they committed their offense under the influence of drugs. And I would like to tell you that in the last six years, I buy the medication for my patients in just maximum security prison. This is the funding he was talking about. We have been sidelined completely. Our policies are not important. Mental health bill has been, we have been going and going and going. Anyway, I will come to the, as she said, the recommendations. Now, as she said about the family, the family is broken. Yes, families are broken. Women are taking the, the lead. Mostly they are the ones that are taking care of the home. But we have to understand that. We have to understand one fact. I'm a realist. You have to understand that. Yes, you are a woman. He's the father, you are the mother, yes. We all have our roles to play. Mm -hmm. The fact that we go to work and leaving our children behind, when the time comes for you to rest, you won't rest. Because that's what we go through now, where you see parents kneeling down and begging me to take care of their 40-year-old son who has been broken down because of drugs or other vices. We have to take care of our responsibility. Even the West that we are following, we need to understand that they have a reason to do what they do. We don't follow. You don't copy. When you are going to copy, copy it right. Okay, copy it right. Let's come back. Nigeria, northern Nigeria, we need to tell ourselves the truth. Believe me, I, I, I'm a feminist, yes. I love female, yes, I love them a lot. But I always tell myself the truth. So let's tell ourselves the truth. Culture is ingrained. Culture is different. Religion is different. But we have combined the two to take the religion as the culture now. Hmm? There are two different things. 
So we have to identify what our roles are as individuals and tell ourselves the truth as my teacher said, Professor Femi. You have to tell yourself the truth. I heard them talk, talking about non-fiction. I was surprised to hear them talk about non-fiction because that's what we call the unconscious mind, bringing it out to people to understand what you are going through. A lot of us do not discuss that. We don't. As parents, as, as elders, as, as we are now, we, have, we are mentors in our own way. We need to help our society. Northern Nigeria needs help. It's not Northeast now. It's the whole of the North. Kasuna is a peaceful state. But lately, we have helicopters every day hovering in Kasana because Zamfara people have relocated to Kasana IDP because they are scared. And all this has to go back to the family system. He has said it. It's the family. Our families are broken. They are shattered. We have to go back to the family system. I always talk and people will say, are you an old woman? I said, yes. I remember when your neighbor will talk to you, your parents wouldn't know. If you do anything wrong, they will deal with you. And you don't have any right to go and tell your mother that auntie this did this to me. Because your mother will add more trouble to, us, to you. <laughs> but now, they do. So if we like, we tell ourselves the truth. If we don't like, at the end of the day, I'll be sleeping, 12 midnight, they will call me, the patient is behind the car with six soldiers. He had locked the parents. He wants to kill them. They will wake me up at night and I have to leave my own children and follow you to go and help your own son <laughs> or your own daughter. Do you understand? And we have to understand that. We have a brain. All of us here have a brain. So if we have a brain, we are not immune to mental illness. Unfortunately. All of us here are prone to mental illness. So if you think like that, then help me. Help him. Help her. Help him save our country and let mental health be the front burner because mental health is total health there is no health without mental health and that's what who said is the state of well-being physical mental and social but we take the physical and delete the mental you cannot function if you are mentally ill you can be blind, you can walk. You can be deaf, you can walk. You can have a class in the society. If you have a mental illness, you come down the social class. You come down, whether you like it or not. Even if you think you are still there, your finances are drained. The government has no business with you. Our mental health bill is hanging. If today we have that mental health bill, we have a law. So we can use our law to back us up with whatever is happening. But there is no law. We are now forced as psychiatrists to become policy makers, to become lobbyists. We are lobbying politicians. Not for me, for my patients. For how long will I do that? We have psychiatrists now in the policy making arena. We have decided that, see, we are in our shells. Let's come out. Let's go and, go and go and fight for our patients. And when they see us, they begin to say, hey, they are here, they are here. I'm well, I'm not mentally deranged. We know you are not mentally ill. But it seems you are mentally ill for not understanding what is going on in the mind of others. Uh, so, just to add a little bit to that, apparently they did a they did a survey a few years ago of some Nigerians. They brought people together in a village, and uh, fifty two percent they asked them what causes mental illness. Fifty two percent of the respondents said uh, witches, and um, and forty four percent said uh, demon possession. Now. Our leaders, our politicians, the people in power who can decide policy, who can decide spending on healthcare, um, come from the same group of people who have this to say. How do, we, how do we get the word out about how the brain works and what mental illness is? And, and how does that add to stigma? And how does that you know, decrease um, access? And, and, and yeah. All right. In this context, thank God I'm with the media people, artists, musicians, and other media people. Well, I'm sorry to say this, but one of our worst enemies are the media. You know why? They depict us 
any mentally ill patient in films is depicted as a dangerous person. Dangerous, very, very dangerous. <laughs> Just this morning, I work 24 seven. Everywhere I am, I am working. My resident called me, my social worker called me from Joss. I had a patient who is, who is suffering from schizophrenia, that's the extreme of mental illness. He was seeing his mother and his wife like a snake. That was last two weeks. So in the process, he was fighting the wife, the mother came in between. So he took a rod from the floor and hit her on the head. Unfortunately, it was the sharp side of the rod. So she became unconscious and was taken to the hospital. For this, so he was bundled back to the hospital because he came, we admitted him, they went against medical advice. And then when this thing happened, they had to bring him back tied back to us. So I admitted him because I was his consultant when he came the first time. Four days into the matter, the mother died. She was in the ICU. She died. What did the media do? What are they supposed to do? They should come and verify what happened. The media went out and was telling everybody that, that the man killed his wife, he's, he's a mother, he's a mother. Do you understand? So they had already given out that impression. Now the social worker, we are trying to help this young man. He is, in, he is my patient and he's doing well. Okay? But the family had already left him. Everybody has gone. So it's now my business on how to take care of him because the whole team is it's me. So I have been battling, sending the social worker, what do we do, calling the pastor and, and whatever. Then this morning she just called me that, ma, there's a problem that this is what the media did. I told her to go to the media house and tell them to retract that information. If I come back, I'm going to sue them. Yes. Because they don't know what happened. They should come and verify. This man is ill. He has been ill for about 10 years. In fact, from childhood, he had been ill. Now you are given a different version. We need advocacy. That's what we need. Because in our mental health policy, the grade is prevention, promotion, advocacy, treatment, rehabilitation, and research. What we are doing is treatment. The advocacy is not there. To promote mental health, we need advocacy. Who will advocate for us? The media. We are doing it, but the media is more pronounced. So if the media is seeing us at the backlight, then there's a problem. If you don't understand what is going on in the media, meet people like me. I have the time and the energy. Because it's not everybody that, that, you know, people are in mental health. Some of them are there for money. If most people now are into drugs, everybody is doing drug, 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 drug. Because there is money, grand. I'm not doing drug. I'm doing my own research with my own money. Because nobody is going to pay me. I can't wait for the developed country to come and tell me what they want me to do for them. When I know what is happening. Asking me, come over. We have seen your papers. Nigeria is not looking at our papers. Because we have recommendations. So that, that is my own plight and that is my own anger. But that will still not deter me from going about and doing my work and telling anybody I see around me that I'm a mental health professional. And we have someone on the panel who writes a column. <laughs> Sir, can I, can I get a commitment to, to, to promote mental health? and Yeah. Can, can we can we make that happen, sir? No, it's absolutely great. <laughs> this good. Yeah. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, in terms of solutions, I, I think when we talk about solution, it comes in different forms. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, policies are absolutely key to this. And like I said before, I'm not going to apologise for my view that I do believe. Gender is an issue when we are talking about mental health. Yeah. Women are definitely marginalized because we are women, because we live in a society where we need to be controlled. Because sadly, the people who make these decisions on policies are usually misogynist men. Yeah. That's the case. Yeah. So I think we need to name that. Uh, that's, that's, that that's one of the solutions. Um, the stigmatizing what mental health actually is is very important. And you're absolutely right. The media plays a big role in this. Listen, I'm going to be open about this. I'm someone who suffers from depression. I'm a picture of mental health. I'm not running around bouncing on people, well, maybe in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> 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 but mental health comes in different forms. And, and for me, it's very, op I think, creating a space. I mean, let's use this space that we're in right now where we can actually admit that I, I could easily say, hey, my name is Leila Hussein and I suffer from depression. 
I'm, a, I'm not ashamed of it. Actually, when I did that, it's when I really had the solution. And I know this is not something I'm going to get rid of. I, and I always tell my patients, when you suffer from depression, it's not something you're going to get rid of. It's learning how to live with it. I have triggers. Yesterday, some of the conversations, I had some serious triggers. And I had like a whole team of women here who kind of took care of me last night. But, and and that's, uh, so that's, again, one of the other solutions. Because even us who sit in these platforms sometimes are not honest about our own experiences. Because we are very good at telling others yeah. what to do. But we don't say, hey, by the way, I'm doing this. I actually became a therapist because I was in therapy myself. And I've been in therapy for the rest of my life. And I, like enjoy, I actually enjoy I, I One solution I brought in, because we, you know, we can't fix everything as individuals. But I think collectively we can bring our skills into this. One of the things I realized, especially coming back to the continent, um, and I work in Kenya and Senegal quite a lot, and I noticed a lot of people were not, couldn't access mental health, not because they didn't want to, they didn't have a psychiatrist or a counselor in that region. So one of the things I said was, one of the things I want to do is go back to my continent and actually share my skills. And I didn't want to put a pressure on somebody to say, hey, you have to go to university for three years. And I think it's important, all of us on this platform who work in mental health, that we start sharing basic skills. So this year, I actually piloted a project on emotional well-being from frontline campaigners who are working in isolation by themselves. You know, and and I'm one, I was one of those, and it sounds like you're one of those. <laughs> and where we, for three days, we sat down really absolutely pin down what was it that was actually the problems that was getting in the way and how we can take care of ourselves emotionally because they were, and as you said the focus has always been on physical aspects I, I remember for mental, uh, uh, for mental health issues so these are the key uh, 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 solutions that I obviously would bring to the table but I would absolutely love to urge you all when we are talking about these issues we have to name them. So we need to stop calling harmful practices, harmful practices, violence. It's violence. Mm -hmm. And we cannot name it differently just because it affects black girls. This is the challenge I have in, in the West at all times. I have white people telling me, well, Leila, you know, we need to be careful how we talk. And I said, well, if I started mutilating your child? <laughs> oh, we will call the police. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's the solution. Because if you're a different skin color, there's a different policy. In the UK, we have an FGM law which everybody celebrated, and I was like, wait a minute, you have a law because of my skin color now? Because if a white girl was mutilated, and by the way, white girls are also affected by FGM. That's another session for another time. <laughs> but if you go and Google it, it's actually out there. There are actually women in the US who I'm now working with who are white, blonde, blue-eyed women who, who do have these practices, not just us. I don't want us to walk away thinking, oh God, us barbaric people, this is what we do. No. Control of women, it's is Kima in the room? Because I don't want to use the word global. global. <laughs> it's universal. I'm scared. <laughs> it's a universal issue. That, so until we actually get that and we name the problems, we cannot tiptoe around mental health, violence against women and girls specifically. But also, men, men, you need to show your emotions. Actually, when the previous panel, some, one of the guys, people clapped when he said, I don't cry anymore. And I actually felt really sad when he said that because I said, hey, we need to welcome crying. We need to welcome anger. We need to, we need to also help those who feel shame because there are days when I walk around and I say, hey, today I'm wearing my cape of shame because that's a real feeling. But I should be feeling safe enough to acknowledge it when I'm in that situation. And that's how we deal with mental health issues is actually naming the actual problem. Um, Prof, you, you write poetry, and um, how does literature and how does creativity help in dealing with um, mental health problems? Um, does, it, does it cause can, can, it? Can I, can I answer my own question first, and then I'll come to that? Uh, 20 minutes, yeah. So the, um, uh, I, I thought that I should say something about um, policy, how to change policy. And I, and I thought that one of the, one of the difficulties that we have uh, in Nigeria is that uh, we haven't got a universal health care system. Because when you've got a universal health care system, then the cost of care is explicit. What I mean by that is that um, if, you, if you, can, you can calculate how much it costs to look after people who've got diabetes, you can calculate how much it costs to look after people with hypertension and strokes and so on, and because you know that, and you know that that is a burden to your economy, then it becomes important to solve them. But if you, if you haven't got a universal health care system, and a lot of people are going for private care, 
then the cost of care is not explicit. And sometimes we need to just say that out aloud so that we know what the facts are. So for example, in the UK, we know that mental health disorders, psychiatric disorders, cost the country 23% of the healthcare costs. And we know how much it actually costs per year to look after people with dementia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, schizo um, mood disorders of various kinds. And we know it's in the, orders, in the order of hundreds of billions of dollars. So what that does, it forces, it forces a politician to sit up. Because if you've got preventative systems, they don't want to spend that much money because they'd rather spend it on something different. So, so that aspect of it is quite, quite, quite important. The second thing to say, and this is for us in the room, uh, it's important also for policymakers, but it's for us in the room, is to say that uh, being relatively well has incredible benefits. And the, the, um, the kind of unnecessary false dichotomy between the physical health and mental health, it is so false that, that I need to make it properly explicit. Sorry if anybody in the room suffers from depression, but there's no need not to know. If you suffer from depression, you are likely to die 20 to 25 years earlier than an, a person who dies. And you don't die from depression. You die from uh, uh, diabetes, you die from uh, uh, hypertension and a stroke, and you die from cancers. Now, to explain that to you, just to make it clear that these are totally useless dichotomies. If you've got depression, your cortisol levels are massively elevated. Your cortisol levels impair your white cells. If your white cells are impaired, if you carry a rogue uh, cell, cancerous, instead of tip. So, so it's, a, it's a complete rubbish, this idea that somehow you've got some people looking after the mind, that you've got some guys looking after the physical body. Because it's all unified. It's all a unity. But the reason for telling you that, what I've just told you, is that it uh, allows us, all of us in this room, to know that these conditions, they are a terrible economic burden to the country. And therefore, you want to prevent them. And we know that if you develop them at a young age, before the age of 13, then it's, you know, the like final year question in the days when I was still a student in medicine was what are the continuities of emotional disorders in psychiatry? And the asthma depressive episode, we're talking also about the kind of things that my colleagues have been talking about, about disruption in early life and so on. So, so I hope I've convinced you that it, it, it is so crucial. It, it is not minimal. It is not absolutely the center of human life. Um, so that's just uh, my, my advocacy for, that's the last you've heard from me making a kind of, advo you know, kind of advocacy for anything. To turn to your real question, which was something to do with literature, and um, and of course this you could argue that um, any contribution at all, you would argue that my contribution is in something called medical humanities, which makes the case, which wants to argue the case that literature matters, and literature matters across the board. So if I just take two examples, uh, a simple example about how literature matters for our profession is that our profession is uh, incredibly technological in the West. And I don't look at you, I just look at a computer. So the technology is impairing the interaction with, uh, between two human beings. But at a more serious level, the way we are educated in medicine, we are educated at the age of 18. So imagine somebody like me at the age of 18, uh, at the University of Ibadan, I went into anatomy. My very first afternoon, was being uh, allocated a dead body. And four of us on one side of the body and four of us on the other side of the body. And you learn how to cut it and to name it. Now, that was being, they, were, they thought they were teaching us the body structures. But actually what they were teaching us was how to be detached. Yeah. They're teaching us how to objectify a human body. And that process of objectification of a human body translates into later life, so that we start to treat patients as if they were just mechanical objects. 
So that's problematic. So my task, part of my task in life is to help to bring the subjective back into clinical practice so that you remind it all the time, just as my colleagues have been talking about, that when you see a real person, you have to remember it's a real person and that that person has a life, they have life goals and life plans, they've got children, they've got lovers, they, you, they, you've got a whole extended network of human beings where, where their distress is going to have an impact on those people too. So, so the medical humanities, literature is the anchor point, and of course I quite often talk about theater, but that's not what you've asked me to talk about today. But the other issue which you raised is whether writing itself, whether it makes a difference, and, and uh, my colleagues at the last session, uh, they were very optimistic and very kind of, um, and that's all right, I have no objections to it at all. So the good aspect is that when you're an author, you have authorial agency. So when you write your own story, you are in charge of it. And, um, and my, at that last session, they were talking about the editorial work. And I thought, yeah, yeah, you're doing editorial work. But what you're really doing is you are reconstructing. You are, you are sitting in the center of your own story and you're altering it to make it better. And the person who reads it then sits in the center of your story and understands how they can make their own, better, their own lives better too. So, so literature has that to do that. It's like my, my young colleagues earlier didn't talk about at all, which they ought to talk about and they've got to be aware of is that it doesn't always do that. And when you think of Sylvia Plath, then you realize that it is, doesn't always work like that. So, so the capacity to authorize your own life in writing can be disruptive is the point I'm trying to make. So, so, but to be optimistic about it, it does do good sometimes. But nothing is always good. Um. So we'll open questions to the audience. Wow. Okay. You guys are ready. <laughs> but we have 10 minutes. So we have to make it really quick. Um, Ms. Adiza. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to Prof and Dr. Aisha. Aisha too, the two psychiatrists we have here. You have to understand that. Here we have a gathering of creatives, writers, artists. So my question is, do you think that there is a relationship between creativity and mental illness? And if you do, um, how can you explain to us, maybe there's some kind of chemical reaction that goes on in the brain? Because like, for instance, the... Um, People, you gave examples of like Sylvia Plath. We know a lot of creatives that have had mental illness. So do you really believe that there's that relationship? And if you do, what do you think might be the reason for that? Thank you. Uh, as you know, I've already hinted this, this morning that there are facts and there are opinions. So we'll, we'll deal with facts first. So the facts are, that it is a matter of fact, it is true that there is a relationship. So that's not an opinion. So, so in other words, the work has been done. Uh, so people have looked at uh, uh, writers and scientists and philosophers and looked to see what the rates of, uh, what the rates of mental illness is in those people. They've also looked at their first degree relatives. Their first degree relatives is a technical term, which means their parents or their siblings or their children. And it is also a matter of fact that the rates of mental illness in their first degree relatives is elevated in comparison to that of the general public. All right, so that's a matter of fact. Um, so the, the issue for us then is to ask ourselves, there are, for me there are two aspects of it which are the most depressing, which is that if it is true, and, they, uh, and we are, if we could predict, for example, whether a baby that's been carried in the, a fetus that's been carried in the womb is going to have one of these mental illnesses. Would it make sense to abort that baby? All right, that, so that's a, quite an important 
ethical moral dilemma that has to be faced. Um, and they asked, they asked um, a woman called Kay Redfield Jemison, who is a, a professor of psychiatry at UCLA, who herself has bipolar disorder, severely, severely disturbed by it. And they asked her whether uh, she would rather not have had it. And she gave a wonderful answer, which is to, to say it's part of me. So she would not rather not had it. Um, but the issue for us is, given that there's this link between some of these conditions and mental illness, if we were to abort all babies who had the propensity to have these disorders, what would that do to creativity in human? All right, so there's that to ask. The, the second, which is not a pessimistic, is just a technical ask, a question about what are the potential mechanisms for this. Um, and I don't know that we know the answer to that. So, but if you take bipolar disorder, for example, where the link is highest, so in a bipolar disorder, either when you're high or whether you're low, if you take when you're high, there's unquestionable the fact that your thinking is sharper, your thinking is faster, the world looks different to you. So, for example, when you go out into the world and you look at the trees, they stand out, the colors shimmer, and if you're gifted with language, you can then capture that absolutely beautifully. And, and even when you're depressed, so there's some technical, I use a technical term, there's something called depressive realism. So depressive realism is the capacity to look at the world as it really is. So when you're depressed, you see the world exactly as it is. Whereas when you're normal, you're always slightly optimistic. So, so in that depressive phase, people come to see the world exactly as it is, and that's helpful to writing or to any kind of art. Um, so, so, but there must be more mechanisms than what I've just said. That's just you know, two potential ways in which there's a link between them. Um, I can take, maybe take one more question, but no comments. It has to be a question. So... Um, can go ahead and take you. Um, my question is for um, Professor and Dr. Aisha. I recently lost a friend to suicide, and we didn't see any signs that she wasn't okay. So I just want to know if there, if someone doesn't want to talk about what's wrong with them, and if they don't want to. I mean, as a friend, you'd want them to get the help that they need. Are there any signs that we can tell that this person needs help? And that's my question. Well, um, suicide is on the rise now, and people are associating suicide to mental illness. But it's not always the case. That's what we think. But it's not always the case. Sometimes it's not. It's not a mental illness that can cause that. But... You can, you as an individual, might not identify somebody that has a mental illness. If, but if you are living with the person, and that's why in mental illness, I don't just go to the street and pick anybody. I can see people walking on the street naked, right? It's not my business. Maybe that's their culture, that's their tradition. <laughs> Do you understand? It's okay. But when your relation, who you share the same home, the same religion, the same culture, the same tradition, everything, it brings you to the hospital and say this person is not speaking in tongues or this person is ill, then you as a doctor should take a look at the patient. But don't assume the patient is ill still because they might assume he's ill and you must. Just like Prof said, the guy in Kano that changed his religion that became, was it, he, he became an atheist. A house yeah. boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, yes, yes, I know. I know. What I'm saying is, he is not, to me, he's not ill. That's his ideology. That's what he wants. Do you understand? So the family cannot force it on him and tell me to do what they want me to do for him. Okay? I, am, I will listen to that person. So if your friend was brought to the hospital, we'll take a look at the, the girl or the lady and ask her certain questions, which will point likely to what is happening, which you wouldn't know. On Thursday last week, two patients were, were, were in our clinic. Prof, sorry for that. Two patients were in our clinic. One was jumping up and down, and the other one was just sitting down quietly. 
the father of the one sitting quietly came to my resident and said, um, doctor, this patient, this, this son of mine is not well. Please, doctor, take a look at him. The doctor said, sorry, that man is jumping, so I'm going to take care of that one. and will come back to you. Fortunately, there's a senior resident there. So the senior resident had them through his door and came out. He said, Baba, what is the problem? He said, my son is ill. I'm telling you, he is very ill. So he said, okay, fine, Baba, go and open the file. Before he went to open the file, the patient ran away. So when the father came back and told us, the patient has gone, we said to her, there's nothing we can do. Try and go and get him back. If you can't get him back, 58. <laughs> so he told them to go and get him back. Unfortunately, they didn't get him back. That was on Thursday. By Sunday, he had committed suicide. Whereas the one jumping is still there. So it's about knowing what you are doing and knowing it well. If that senior registrar was not there, the resident that is just coming into training might think because he's still quietly, he's well. But if it's another person, will, I will pick it. Another person will pick it. I might at the same time again run into trouble by not picking it, depending on my mindset. And that's why I say, at certain points, I shut down. And I tell them I will not see any patient at that time. So she, she would have been ill or not. Now I cannot tell you because I didn't see her. Thank you. Just, just, to, add, just to add to that very, very briefly, um, the um, a, a famous Nigerian writer wrote in The Guardian about uh, six weeks ago that um, he lives in America and said that, you know, the, how terrible it was in America that all these people kill themselves. But, you know, how we Nigerians, you know, how resilient we are. <laughs> so that upset me. It upset me incredibly because I thought that was so ignorant. So, so I, I bring that up because it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why it might happen without people noticing because there's a kind of uh, illusion that, that, that these problems don't exist here, that we are such powerful, strong people, when that's, not, that's just not true at all. And, and the final point is that um, in, in about a quarter of suicides, it comes out of the blue. So that even people who know them very, very well would not recognize that it's about to happen. And, and I say that out aloud because friends and relatives then feel guilty that maybe they ought to have recognized it. But, but you have to keep in mind that it is not always predictable. I have five minutes. Um. Question. Hello, Hello. Good, good morning. My name is Mustafa Terry. Um, and my question is, there are several cases whereby we hear of, of famous, rich, and powerful people. They commit crimes, and then they get a senior advocate that will get them a licensed, qualified uh, psychiatrist that will write them a medical report saying that they are mentally ill. And then they will use that medical report to escape that, uh, the, the, the punishment for that crime. So what do you have to say about that, please? Well, yes, you can say that. I think I've written about 30 forensic reports to the court, to the police, and I've been to court to stand for patients. The point is, a person commits a crime. I was not there when he committed a crime. He is brought to the prison. And you call me. I just finished with a lawyer, I think three weeks ago. A patient is, is in the prison, I'm seeing the patient, and the patient has depression. And that's what I'm managing. And he has hypertension. So that's what I'm managing. And the lawyer is here telling me that the patient, when they get to the court, that he doesn't understand what is going on, he doesn't talk, he doesn't do... I said, well, what I'm seeing is not what you are telling me. Sir, yes, he's an, old, he, he's an older person, but I told him categorically, yes, they told me to come and meet Dr. Armiao. I said, yes, I am. I'm, I'm Dr. Armiao and I'm here. And I will not write what you want me to write. Because what I see is not what you are telling me. And the patient is right in front of me. So I will not write what you want me to write. I will write exactly what is there. Okay? 
And what is there is not what you are telling me. This guy doesn't have epilepsy. This guy is sound. He's sharp. He is there with me. So I will not write what you want. And what I did was to simply take the folder of the patient away from the clinic because I bought it. So I took the folder away, gave my resident and told them to keep it at home because we could come back tomorrow and they tell me, the prison will tell me they can't find it. Okay? Then I was very calm and I told him, if you want a second opinion, you could get another person to write the report for you. And that was how it ended. So absolutely that happened because they give money. But I don't collect money and I will not collect money. I work by my conscience and I do what is right. I'm being told that we no longer have time. <coughs> okay, last, very last one and then I'll get a comment from Leila. Last one. Um, my, uh, my name is Furira. Back to the question that um, was earlier asked. I think uh, what we want to know is, as friends and family, are there telltale signs? I know that you cannot predict, but there, are there telltale signs that you see that would help you support someone that you think might be headed towards suicide? I'll um, say one or two things about this. I think that um, we know that if somebody's behavior changes, Shh. if their behavior changes radically, we know that you ought to be concerned. So if you've got a child, a young person who is normally outgoing, who is usually gregarious, who usually will come out and talk to the rest of the family, who start to spend a lot of time in their own bedroom, then we know you ought to be worried. And we know that if that person you make the usual inquiries and usual attempts to make them talk and feel like as comfortable as they used to, and you have having difficulty, then you mustn't underestimate the importance of it. I think that in the, um, and even in the South, when hopelessness and suicidal thinking has to be different um, because, because of religion. So, so for other people, you could ask directly whether the person is feeling hopeless, whether they think they're not thinking of the future. You can ask them whether they're actually thinking that they want to end their lives. But you wouldn't normally ask it like that with a Muslim person because you've got to ask it in a passive way. You've got to ask whether they sometimes think that uh, if Allah was to say that their lives could come to an end, they would be agreeable to it. Do you see what I mean? So it's a different, it's a different way of making those inquiries. Uh, and you just have to be sensitive to those differences which are determined by culture and religion and so on. But it's, a, it's an impossible area. I think the main thing is to keep, it, uh, to keep in touch with the fact that people, generally speaking, don't change significantly and radically. And if they do, you have to be concerned that something may be wrong. I just wanted to follow up on that, actually. Um, I, years ago, I worked with families whose kids committed suicide. But what would the, one, one, one theme that all shared was there was an instinct that something was not right, but they just didn't voice it. So I, I would actually say to you, instinct is usually something you need to really follow up and keep an eye on. Like that's, that's the only advice I think all, any of us can give you. Yep. And, Oh, Lola's not here, but anyway, I was going to give her some sort of a <laughs> um, suggestion. One thing I've... Oh, she's here. Lola, I had a suggestion for you, actually. One thing I've learned in this work, um, we need to start creating safe spaces for us to keep continue having these conversations. And any time I organize any conference or festivals or those who are organizing such events, I always encourage them to have a safe room. And sometimes we, you would get uh, uh, counsellors to come and volunteer their time for that day. And absolutely for us uh, in our work, it's been really useful because it was a safe space where people can just come in during a festival like this and they can just talk to someone and if they needed help. So I would like to urge you, someone like you who runs such an amazing uh, uh, festivals and platforms, let's continue to start creating little room spaces where people can just come in and just have someone they can talk to or just get uh, a chance to settle their mind. I think it's important just to have those little initiatives in our spaces. Yeah, that's all I just wanted to add. Have we finished? Oh, I just wanted to say, um, 
Professor Jibrin Ibrahim has had to leave us. He's on the two o'clock train to Abuja. Um, and, uh, but um, Kolade Arogundade stopped him and said, given what we see um, in government, is kleptomania um, still regarded as a mental health illness? <laughs> So, um, Professor Jibrin, Jibrin answered that that's actually what he wanted to talk about at his session tomorrow. So, I think very quickly, it might be interesting to ask the psychiatrists here what they think about that very quickly. You will know, and... and um, we can't have a we can't have a, a session like this without me saying something about Trump, <laughs> and and I just want to use Trump to say to make a point, which is that you will you will all know that lots of people want to say that Trump is ill, and it may be true that he's ill, but a lot of people working in psychiatry think it's an insult to mentally ill people. <laughs> yes. So, so, so it seems, it's, it, from, a, from a psychiatrist's point of view, it is best to regard him as a bad person than to regard him as mentally ill. And which is a nice way of saying, that's what I think about the situation in Nigeria. So that it is an insult to the people that Aisha and I see to want to say that the people who steal, that they're mentally ill. You, you, you know, it, it's, just, it's just nothing to do with it. And, um, and you, mustn't, you, mustn't, um, you, mustn't be mis you mustn't be misled by the, the word mania at the end of klepto. <laughs> you know? Do you to me? You mustn't be misled to start to think. But that kleptomania in the classification system is talking about compulsive um, stealing. But usually, um, somebody who is in a, who's got a, a problem with their frontal lobes, who is in a shop, who has difficulty in, um, in repressing their uh, impulses. So when they see something, not usually something not expensive, when they see it in a shop, and their natural instinct, impulsive act, is to pick it up. The rest of us too might have that feeling, but we're able to repress it because we've got a functioning forebrain. Uh, but these people aren't able to repress it, and they take it. But often they're taking it in full daylight. And they're doing it repeatedly. They're not doing it... You know, they're not organizing it like the Nigerian politicians are. <laughs> you, you, you know, so it's a misnomer to call them what we would recognize as kleptomania. Uh, and I think it's much, much, much better to make these people properly, properly accountable for their misbehavior. And on that note, um, I think in... <laughs> I want to apologize to our American sponsors, who, but I don't too. So, um, I, anyway, I'll, it's okay. It's, well, it, this is conversation, right? And it's important. We t it's a safe space. What happens at Kaba Fest? Yeah. Okay. So, I want to thank um, the speakers today, the panelists who have been absolutely incredible. I've learned so much in this panel of you as well, yeah? It's been so illuminating. So a massive thank you first to the moderator, Ms. Temi Giwa. Huge thank you to our two panelists who have come in from the UK. I just asked them and they said yes. And that warms my heart. Leila Hussein and Professor Femi Oyebode. And of course, this woman is just... You know, it's one thing, it's, it, it's one thing to, to have good intentions, right? But sometimes it's a completely different matter when you're actually there in the grassroots, on the field, doing the work. And that's what she's doing in Northern Nigeria. And she's a Northern Nigerian. And I think your attitude is one that many of us need to emulate. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Professor Jibrin Ibrahim, who's not here, 
and um, who's had to leave. Please give him a round of applause. Yeah, his comments were very important. So just a few housekeeping um, um, points that I'd like to raise. So we've got this art fair here. That art has to be bought too. <laughs> Sometimes I'm think, I think I'm talking to the wrong audience here. <laughs> because these are you people who like books, you don't have money. Eh? <laughs> but please dig deep and let's support these artists. They're young, many of them are young artists who've just applied for this program and this opportunity, and I'd really like to see them supported. Even if you can't buy, please stop by and have a look. Encourage them, say thank you, tell them their work is great, if you really believe it is. It always helps and it just encourages them. Um, we've also got Sterling Bank here. They're still available if you want to open accounts and collect a package, a gift bag of three books. Very, very important that we do this moral duty to open Sterling Bank accounts because they are our sponsors. And you heard them. At the opening ceremony, they said they are sponsoring next year and the year after. Not so. So let's, as writers, we have a duty to have a Sterling Bank account. <laughs> so please do stop by and um, yeah, try and get one. So lunch is served. And we'll be back here at three. Thank you. Sorry.